Good morning and a very, very warm welcome to Breakfast with Arab. Um, it's fantastic to see a full house again. Thank you for your continued support and interest. My name is Farah and I'm the Marketing and Communications Leader for Buildings London. A very warm welcome to you all. And so to our speaker, born in Chatham, Kent, Ben came from a family of engineers. He loved maths and physics at school, and of all the engineering disciplines, the one that appealed to Ben the most was structural engineering. He was curious about how people interact with buildings and thought that this profession would be incredibly rewarding as part of a design team. Choosing to study at the University of Surrey, this enabled Ben to spend a year with a French company as part of his master's. Ben spent a year in Lyon working with Electricity de France, where he was introduced to nuclear power stations. Completing his degree, Ben was determined to find a job at Arup, and only at Arup. He started with the firm in 2000, joining a group that specialised in the design of factories, pharmaceutical facilities and industrial manufacturing. Shortly after getting married, Ben and his wife relocated to Brussels on a secondment with Procter & Gamble. Ben's portfolio of projects include a broad range of different sectors, including pharmaceutical, science, industrial, healthcare, rail, air and commercial buildings. Taking on different roles, either as lead civil or structural engineer, design team leader, lead building designer, project manager, or now as project director, Ben has developed a love for multidisciplinary design and enjoys the human aspect of projects, working with different people from different backgrounds. Ben cares about delivering a process that seeks to help advance society, whether it is a factory delivering consumer goods or a railway station transporting workers and visitors to their destinations. Refreshingly, Ben's passion lies in the process, not so much as which architect he's working with or the next most glamorous building. He really does care about making the process work for all across sectors, building typologies and infrastructure. Ben fell into waste by his team winning a project on energy <laughs> from waste in 2009, having been determined to win in the sector for, since 2006. He's currently working as lead building designer on an energy from waste facility in Kent. So without further ado, it really is my great pleasure to introduce the very lovely and utterly charming Ben Glover, who's going to tell us why we are sending our rubbish to Germany. Thank you very much, everyone. A very good morning to you all. Thank you for the introduction, Farah. Today, I'm going to share with you some of my thoughts about this great nation and hopefully leave you to consider your position in our society and how we can make post-Brexit Britain great and recognised for its technical skills and innovation. You may have noticed the scenes from the Olympic Games opening ceremony when you entered this morning. 200 years after the Industrial Revolution, it is still recognised as maybe the most important thing this country will ever do. When we consider the Industrial Revolution, the names of great innovators, inventors and engineers spring to mind. James Watt, George and Robert Stevenson, James Brindley, Samuel Crompton, Richard Arkwright. Their brilliant entrepreneurial and innovative visions took advantage of the moment. This was all about great people. We don't often think about the government's involvement in orchestrating the movement. No doubt if we peel back a few layers, we'd find they had some involvement at some level, but hardly at the forefront of this momentous occasion. They did, however, step into the aftermath. Child labour, workhouses, poverty, public health, sanitation. But I guess you would expect this kind of reactive approach from any government. We don't often celebrate the Industrial Revolution. Is it because it was also the moment when we started to burn the planet's energy store? The sun had been pouring power into the planet for countless <coughs> millennia. The Industrial Revolution was the exact moment in history when the process was irreversibly reversed. 
So 200 years later, why do we find ourselves exporting our waste material to European neighbours? Having worked in the waste resource industry since 2009, my peripheral thoughts had been ringing alarm bells for a while, but I couldn't quite put my finger on the problem. Do we have the governments in action to blame? Surely this waste would be better used on our shores rather than dragging it across the borders using countless tonnes of diesel in transportation. What have the government done to help? Do long-term decisions by the government leave long-lasting effect on industry? I'd like to start with a brief canter across Europe. I thought a good place to start would be in France. The French are so involved with the waste resource industry they must be doing something right. Clearly, French technical knowledge is paramount to the Hinkley Point nuclear project, which has been in the press recently. Ironically, Britain was one of the first Western powers to embrace nuclear energy, and yet its growth stalled while France invested heavily in this remarkable alternative to fossil fuels. For while 75% of French electricity comes from nuclear power, only 18% of British electricity does. The French can often be heard defending their reliance on nuclear power. We have no coal, we have no oil, we have no gas, we have no choice. And doesn't this hint at the different courses the two nations have taken? Whilst the British could fall back on coal, oil and gas reserves, the French needed something else. France has a long relationship with nuclear power, starting with Henri Becquerel's discovery of natural radiation in the 1890s, and continued by famous scientists such as Pierre and Marie Curie. In 1945, the French took an aggressive path towards nuclear self-sufficiency. They set up a government agency, the Centre for Atomic Energy, and a few years later, they built their first nuclear reactor. The French nation offers its citizens one of the cheapest electricity prices in Europe. They are one of the biggest electricity <coughs> exporters in the EU. France's nuclear power industry has been called a success story and it's put the nation ahead of the world in terms of providing cheap energy with low carbon emissions. However, recent polls show that the majority don't support nuclear power and they may be on the cusp of a partial nuclear phase-out. Last year, the National Assembly voted that by 2025 only 50% of France's electricity will be produced by nuclear power. And now we cross the border into Germany. The situation in Germany can be summarised by one word, and it's a German word, energy vendor. This literally means energy turnaround or energy transformation. Germany intends to eliminate their nuclear power production by 2022. It is expected that fossil fuel, wind power, solar power, biofuels and energy conservation will be enough to replace the existing capacity from nuclear power. Once nuclear power is phased out, there will be an emphasis on progressive replacement of fossil fuels by renewables. The government has set a goal of meeting 80% of the country's energy demands from alternative energy by 2050. And they spend 1.5 billion euros per year on energy research in an effort to solve the technical and social issues raised <coughs> by the transition. And finally, to conclude our visit to Europe, what is Denmark's take on energy? In Denmark, the majority of waste is incinerated to generate heat and electricity with very low emissions. The rest is mostly recycled. Waste is burned to heat a boiler that generates steam for a turbine. The turbine runs a generator to create electricity. Excess heat can be used for heating. Denmark now has 29 waste to energy plants in a country of 5.5 million people and 10 more plants are planned or under construction. Across Europe there are around 400 plants with Denmark and Germany and the Netherlands leading the pack in expanding them and building new ones. The Danish have a great attitude to this technology. Plants are placed in the heart of communities that they serve so that the heat of burning garbage can be efficiently piped into homes lowering heating costs. Planners take great pains to separate residential traffic from trucks delivering garbage. And some of the newest plants are encased in elaborate outer shells that resemble sculptures. Many countries that are expanding waste to energy capacity like Denmark and Germany typically also have the highest recycling rates. Only the material that cannot be recycled is burned. In Denmark, just 4% of their waste is placed into landfills. 
In Denmark, local governments run trash collection as well as the incinerators and recycling centres and laws and financial incentives ensure that recyclable material is not burned. Communities may drop recyclable waste at recycling centres free of charge but must pay to have garbage incinerated. This compared to the UK where everything is outsourced and the public are left wondering if their carefully sorted recycling is actually recycled <coughs> or landfilled. Do you really know where your waste goes after it's been collected? In Europe, environmental laws have hastened the development of waste to energy plants. The European Union severely restricts the creation of new landfill sites and its nation have already a binding commitment to reduce their carbon dioxide emissions. From a pollution perspective, today's energy generating incinerators have little in common with the smoke belching models of the past. They have arrays of newly developed filters and scrubbers to capture the offending pollution. Emissions from the plant have been reduced to just 10 to 20 percent of levels allowed under the European Union's strict environmental standards. At the end of the incineration process, the extracted acids, heavy metals and gypsum are sold for use in manufacturing and construction. Small amounts of highly concentrated toxic substances are stored in warehouses for highly hazardous materials. The hazardous materials are handled with care rather than dispersed as they would be in landfills. The Danish have a different mindset to the British. They are already promoting Copenhagen 2025, the world's first carbon neutral city. So where does Britain fit in amongst these other great nations? Well, we're doing our part. Maybe not as effectively as we could be, but we are getting there, slowly. With such a comparatively small nation, packed full with a growing population, you would have thought common sense would have prevailed. But many years ago, when we started to realise we had to do something with our waste, the idea to bury it was put forward. Right up until the 1980s, Policies of successive governments had endorsed landfill. Following the Earth Summit in Rio and the 1992 Agreement on Sustainable Development, Britain finally realised that it was no longer acceptable to leave waste buried to be dealt with by future generations. In 1996, Britain introduced the landfill tax. There are lots of good reasons to avoid landfilling. Mixed waste contains high levels of biodegradable content, which degrades over time, releasing greenhouse gases. Another good reason to avoid landfill is that once you have buried your valuable resource, it will invariably need to be replaced by a newly made product. Take one aluminium can, for example. By reusing it, it saves 95% of the energy required to make the same amount of aluminium from its virgin source. On top of these great reasons, landfills are unsightly, smelly, and who would want one in their backyard? With landfill tax in operation, the UK had an economic reason to stop depositing waste into the ground. But we've hardly stamped it out completely. Of the 85 million tonnes of waste produced in the UK in 2012, a whopping 21 million tonnes of waste was ploughed into the ground. If you think that sounds bad, this is actually a 70% improvement from turn of the century rates when we rammed 70 million tonnes of waste into the ground. Germany, Holland, Belgium, Sweden, by stark contrast, landfill next to nothing, whilst Denmark and Austria send less than 5% to landfill. We find ourselves a long way behind the EU average, still needing to make an impact with alternative waste management methods. A good indicator of how EU countries are doing in their battle against waste is to take a look at recycling rates. By 2020, EU countries should recycle at least 50% of their municipal waste. As you might expect, top of the class goes to Austria, Germany, Belgium, the Netherlands and Switzerland who have already achieved their 2020 targets. The UK is not too far short of the target and expecting to achieve 50% by 2020. In a relatively short period of time, the UK has managed to promote a culture of recycling, increasing our recycling rates from just 12% in 2001 to 39% in 2010. For those of you who were living in the UK at the time, you will remember when we used to throw everything in the bin. Then there was a step change and recycling was clearly pushed up the agenda by the government of the time. Fossil fuel is overwhelmingly the most used fuel in Europe. Over 60% of our electricity comes from fossil fuels. 
the remaining is nuclear and renewables. You might be surprised to hear that Germany is in the same position, slightly less nuclear and a bit more renewables. And I was surprised by the Dutch, nearly 90% of their electricity coming from fossil fuels. The picture in Denmark, as you would expect, is better, with less than 50% of their electricity coming from fossil fuels. The Danish produce a huge percentage of their electricity from wind power and are, as a result, world leaders in this technology. As we've already discussed, with such a high reliance on nuclear, the French use less than 10% fossil fuels for their electricity. And it's worth noting how the Norwegians behave impeccably with a negligible amount of fossil fuels being used. Hydropower delivers the majority of their electricity. I think the picture here is partly about the natural resources a country has available to them, but also about the decisions a country has made in order to wean themselves from carbon intensive fuels. So any route to reducing our reliance on fossil fuels is a win. The annual waste from an average UK household is just over a tonne. And that could power a washing machine and a dishwasher in the same household over the same duration. And that's using rubbish, something which we used to bury. If I told you that here in the UK we could use our rubbish to fuel 5% of current renewables electricity production, I think you would agree that this is a small but significant contribution. We could, but sadly, we don't. Over the past few years, we have started to export our waste to our European neighbours. In 2012, almost 1 million tonnes of waste was exported to other European countries from the UK. The most popular destinations for the, this export were Denmark, Germany, the Netherlands, Norway and Sweden. This export business is generally seen as a success. It's not just as easy as dumping the rubbish into containers and sending them abroad. The preparation of export waste requires a basic level of treatment to remove valuable recyclates from predominantly municipal black bag rubbish. Why do we do this? Well, it makes sense to retain this valuable commodity and reuse it here rather than sending it abroad. Get ready for this bit. We have our government, yes, our government, to thank for this ounce of common sense. Unbelievably, other nations who export their waste, not naming names, don't remove this valuable commodity. But why is the waste export seen as a success? It's a way of depositing and disposing of our waste, but at what cost? Here's how the costs add up. Preparing the waste, baling and wrapping, on-land transportation, administration, port costs, sea transportation. And once the waste arrives at our European neighbours' facility, we still have to pay them to take it off our hands. This payment is known as the gate fee. All this equates to around 80 to 100 euros per tonne. How does this stack up to being a viable business? It stacks up because the alternatives in the UK just aren't all that rosy. We can landfill it, and I think I've moaned about that enough already, or we can burn it ourselves. In financial terms, the UK are paying almost 43 million to foreign energy from waste facilities. However, this fuel could be used to reduce the UK's spend on coal, save on European gate fees, and divert a similar amount to the UK economy through domestic gate fees. Herein lies the problem. Gate fees in the UK are considerably higher than European competition. Most of these competitors offer low gate fees, either due to having already paid back their initial investments or due to the level of revenue they can receive from electricity, heat and steam sales. This is as a result of their government making a decision many years ago which has put them in a fortunate position today. Gate fees in the UK, not surprisingly, track against the cost of landfill tax. As landfill tax increases, so does the gate fee. We struggle to compete on gate fee. We rarely make use of the waste heat, as unlike Denmark, we don't build our plants close enough to homes and businesses which could benefit from this low-grade heat. We struggle to compete on plant efficiency. The only domestic benefit is the reduced transport required compared to exporting to the continent. But with shipping costs currently close to zero, and the large part of the UK being closer to a port than a domestic EFW plant, these transport costs are not significant in the overall price and therefore not prohibitive. We struggle to compete on an economically viable alternative. 
So in order to develop a viable energy from waste plant in the UK, the project will need to secure a waste supply. And to achieve that supply, it will have to compete against European facilities. To do this, we need to be able to maximise the revenue potential of these plants. As I said, not only do these plants process waste, they also have the ability to produce waste heat, steam and electricity. It is by combining the revenue streams of waste and power production against the cost of building and operating a plant that allows a facility to be viable. For waste, heat and steam, the facilities need to be built close enough to homes and businesses. In Europe, this is commonplace for the heat to be sold, which increases the efficiency of a plant from 20% to 80%. We rarely do this in the UK. The electricity revenue is governed by a quite different set of rules. Electricity costs are driven by fossil fuel prices or the cost to produce the energy if renewable or nuclear. For example, in France, we see the cheaper energy costs with their well-established nuclear programme. So if you were buying electricity from power stations, would you just buy the cheapest or would you buy the least carbon intensive? In the world of consumer power, the only option is to buy cheap. So how does the government persuade energy supply companies to purchase green electricity? They have to introduce an incentive which forces the energy supply companies to buy a certain amount of green energy. In my experience, there are too many things which can go wrong with these projects in the UK. Is there sufficient waste available? Is the right financial incentive available? Has planning been achieved? Or has a long and protracted NIMBYism planning review been launched? If our government had courage in their convictions, these important decisions could be fast-tracked, like in Denmark, where they build these facilities in city centres. Without government backing, projects all too often fail or take up to a decade to materialise. What we are seeing in Europe is that as communities recycle more and more, the calorific value of their waste diminishes. Removing biological municipal waste and sending this to an anaerobic digestion fits well with a circular economy. This is all great news and shows that valuable waste is being reused efficiently. But it isn't great news for the waste to energy operators who struggle to find the waste stream they need to keep their plants in operation. Currently the waste we send to Europe helps to top up this shortfall. But with this in mind, I feel that the UK needs to learn from Europe. In 2020, we anticipate a waste gap of up to 8 million tonnes. That is to say that at the moment we do not have the infrastructure to deal with this 8 million tonnes of waste. Landfill should be avoided, and there isn't much space anyway. We don't have enough waste to energy plants to process this waste. And so we can expect to continue to export this valuable commodity. But if we act collaboratively with thought and vision, we could start to build a new wave of waste to energy plants, which could be operational in the early 20s to help meet this waste gap. And learning from the Europeans, we know we will continue to recycle more and more so we should build plants to cope with the glut of waste we can expect to produce over the next 30 years and then phase them out as we head towards a circular economy. That is if we can get our acts together. And with Brexit, that is a big if. I feel that with each successive government we dilute the good work which has been done before. Following the appointment of Theresa May as Prime Minister, her cabinet reshuffle managed to merge the Department for Business, Innovation and Skills with the Department for Energy and Climate Change into the Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy. Should we not simply have a Department for Energy? Clearly, whilst the government trigger Article 50 and negotiate our way out of the EU, will we continue to put as much effort into pursuing improvements to our energy infrastructure? Should energy self-sufficiency now be a priority? Hinkley Point C is a huge step in the right direction, but can our government keep making these difficult decisions? During the Industrial Revolution, great individuals, given the right situation, can make a huge difference to society. In France, the nuclear programme, and in Germany with their energy transition, a decisive government can lead a nation. In Denmark, with their love of waste to energy, when a visionary public coupled with a progressive government, amazing advances can be made. But the UK government always seemed to be a step behind, being less than proactive when it comes to waste. The waste industry in the UK is a complicated place, needing a fine balance of ingredients to succeed. 
We need a strong government to work through the many obstacles which currently stand in the way. We also need great individuals to challenge the government at every step. You might be wondering what you can do. Well, where does your waste go? From your home and from your business? At home, your local council will dictate how you separate your waste. Why not find out where it goes from there? Where I live in Kent, the garden and food waste is composted locally and reused on local farms. Mixed recycles are separated before being sent to private companies for recycling into new products. Most of our non-recyclable waste is taken to South East London's energy recovery facility. Unfortunately, around 18% of household waste is sent to landfill, but they promise that they are working to address this further and move as close to zero landfill as possible. Here at Arup, we separate our waste at source, and by selecting a business partner to deal with our waste, we specify how we want it treated. At the moment, we can say we want the residual waste to be treated by an energy recovery plant, but we currently can't specify whether th that facility is in the UK or in the EU. If we collectively feel strong enough uh, and start to specify incineration in the UK, what would happen? You might expect a slight hike in your waste bill, but that's the worst that can happen. Should we give it a try? Waste is one of the short-term challenges this nation needs to deal with, and at the moment the government is only playing a peripheral role, reviewing our waste export policy and helping with financial backing to selective projects. If we continue like this, we can expect the waste export business to continue to grow tenfold in the coming years. But we can make a difference and take responsibility. My plea to you all as an industry is let's take the future in our hands and begin to see the value in waste. And in doing so, look after this planet Earth. Thank you. So, if anyone's got any questions, uh, Wendy? How do you convince people that it's okay to have an energy from waste plant in their backyard and improve the planning? Yeah, well, I think we look at our neighbours in Denmark to see the answer to that. These waste facilities can provide their waste heat, and that can be used for heating in houses, just piped straight into the homes or the businesses, and it's, it's a very cheap way to heat buildings. And so if, um, if we were to take up that as an offer, I think people would find it a lot easier to have these in their communities. And on top of that, I think what, what we see Denmark doing with these plants is um, creating elaborate structures around them, and they're, they're really become, they really become part of the community. Um, for example, some of their waste plants, which are central to city centres, have viewing platforms where the public can just wander up and look across the city. You know, they might be able to go into a little um, educational section which talks about recycling. And you know, all those things can bring the community in so they understand the technology and they benefit from it. And, you know, if that was the case, why wouldn't you want one? There's another question. Yeah, you talk about energy from waste in fairly glowing terms, but we all know that it's pretty close to the bottom of the energy hierarchy. Yeah. Shouldn't we actually be moving to making energy from waste redundant, hopefully for in the future? Yeah. And is it not really a favour of <coughs> the circular economy? It, it does not work with a circular economy. It's a good question. I hope everyone heard that okay. Um, I think that the issue is at the moment that we just don't have a circular economy, and we do have a lot of waste. And I think looking at our European neighbours, we see that they have, you know, in advance of the UK, put these plants in place to deal with the waste now. And they are seeing that they're recycling more and more as they head towards a circular economy. And therefore, these plants are running out of waste to burn, which is why our waste being exported to them is so helpful. And that's why I kind of feel that it is a short-term problem. We need to deal with this waste over the next 30 years, probably, about the lifetime of a plant. And at the end of that period, I'd like to think we're in much more of a circular economy and these plants can be phased out, reused as something else, you know. So it is certainly a short term. Yes? Just to comment on our consumer culture, we still have unrecyclable packages in the supermarket. You have four pairs packed in non-recyclable yeah. and you dispose them in them. Imagine each house buying these four pairs and put non-recyclable packaging into the waste. 
You never see it in European supermarkets where you have such amount of unrecyclable. It's something we as a consumer should demand from the, our supermarket provide us recyclable packaging. Mm. And there's something really upsetting when I do my food shopping, have so much to dispose into the bin. And may I ask what nation you're from? Uh, I'm Russian. Russian. Sorry, but I used to live in Europe, so we have good facilities there. Yeah, I totally agree. And I think um, only by a consumer having the power to purchase what they want can we make a difference. So, and I really think it's everybody making that difference. You know, if we really object to that, we should tell the, the supermarkets not just walk past and leave it. I, I mean, I really think that if everybody makes a noise about this, things will change. But I think at the moment, we don't make enough of a fuss about this and we just, we let it go. I think we need to be more like Europe and uh, make a difference there. Yes. So, um, in Denmark, you say uh, the power stations are nearer to cities and towns. How do you bring the waste in? Is that by road? Will that cause more of a problem in the UK by congesting the roads? Or does rail fit within that? Can you link rail to these units? So I had to get rail. With your client sitting either side of you from Network Rail. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Simon. <laughs> um, well, look, look the, the great thing about having these facilities in the centre of cities is that that is where the waste is generated. So you could maybe have a smaller plant um, but the waste is, is there and it doesn't need to be transported far. I mean, I mentioned about my uh, local council. We drive the waste from Medway, where I live, all the way into London along the A2. And I, I just think that's crazy. There's another plant which is um, you know, ha at least half the distance away. Why doesn't our waste go there instead? I think the further these plants are away from city centres, the, the less um, efficient they are. And like you saw the statistic, if we can use that waste heat, that improves the efficiency from 20% to 80%. You know, if, if we can use that revenue stream to help make these plants more um, cost effective, that's where the, the real step change will be. Yes? We built loads more plants and we ended up recycling them so there's less waste. Do you think we'll be able to recycle the material that's been put into landfill? There have been a few instances that I've heard of, some really interesting, slightly crazy ideas at the moment. But, yeah, I think that there are some great ideas out there and people are looking at this already. So, for example, um, because landfills, if they're built correctly, are lined, there's a potential to dig out all of that waste, use it in a waste-to-energy plant, and then reuse that, that landfill for, um, as a reservoir or something like that, you know, and, and create a... A recreational space around it. So there's a potential to do that, but we don't see our European neighbours doing that at the moment, I guess because they get such cheap waste from the UK. Is, it, is there a time limit on the, how it degrades and then it becomes unviable? For do we have any experts on uh, waste degrading <laughs> in the audience? Um, really not sure, but to be honest, you know, that, that waste is, is still there, and so it will have a calorific value the plastics won't have degraded um, over the period of time. So yes, um, I imagine if we got that desperate, we could dig it out. But you know, if we build these plants, in 30 years' time, we could be in a similar position as the Germans are now. And uh, who knows, we might be importing waste from China, you know? Yes? I totally agree with what you're saying, but in my experience, the bottleneck is quite often the local authority themselves because they still time themselves into 20-year um, partnerships that puts the waste into landfill and not into energy for waste. So unless that's released and made public, then your experience and the experience that we have in other parts of the UK will still continue. Yeah, I totally agree. I mean, uh, the, the contracts um, that underline these kind of developments are really long-term contracts, and local authorities you know, don't really have an option, they have to tie themselves into these contracts. Um, but with landfill tax, that, that has helped them to try and divert. And of course, if they over landfill, they get fined by the European Union. So that's a, an added incentive to divert the waste from landfill. But you're right, these, uh, these contracts are um, something we need, one of the many things that the government needs to negotiate. Sorry, there were some questions over this side of the room. Hi. Yeah, so congratulations on your appointment as uh, Secretary of State for Energy. Um, I know that your first move will be to order a new ministerial Jaguar, but your second, third and fourth moves, what would they be and how long would it take? 
Wow, I hadn't thought that one through. <laughs> but great to be in the position. Let me go and buy that jag and I'll have a think about that. Um, I mean, I, I know that, that this, this waste um, is not uh, high up the energy hierarchy. It's not something that's going to solve our problems. It's just a step in the right direction. But I really feel that we can overcome some of the, the issues like planning, um, getting the public perception in, in, uh, increase that they're aware and they can benefit from these plants. So I think if I was just thinking about waste, then clearly I'd, um, I'd, I'd be promoting this and trying to unlock some of the um, issues which prevent them from um, coming into fruition. As for the, re the rest of the uh, energy infrastructure, you know, clearly it needs somebody to be dedicated to looking at just energy and climate change. I think that goes very well together. I, I really don't understand why we've recently um, confused matters by um, diluting it in another department. I thought it was very, very relevant, very, very important, and the facts that he backed his talk up with, I had no idea how bad we as a country are in terms of energy recycling. So it's a wake-up call. It's obvious if we make a difference, we're going to make a difference as teams, so we've got to do it together. Nobody can like designing a building, you can't do it on your own, it's a team effort. Um, starts with awareness and that's where I thought Ben's talk was excellent because uh, I'm always more interested in the big picture than a load of detail and he started with the big picture and the big picture is not good, it's bad and we all need to be aware. I, I it was a very good talk and um, I think Ben delivered it really well. Um, um, it was inspiring because I think um, I've, I've always thought that um, energy power stations are always put out on the coast or in the countryside and I really think I've always uh, wondered why we don't put energy centres in towns where they can deliver heat to houses. So I thought Ben's talk um, was very inspiring because it's um, a, a way of getting energy back into towns and, and connected with communities. So, um, so that, was, that was very in, in, inspiring. Um, as how my practice um, can make a difference um, at the moment, I don't know, because we're very small, but um, hopefully in the future, uh, once um, infrastructure is, is, is delivered and um, connected with, with uh, residences and swimming pools and schools and so on, then, then um, I think we'll, we'll just have a much better connected energy infrastructure and, and communities. A really, really great talk from Ben. Um, fascinating insight. Uh, and a lot, of, a lot of detailed content. For me and my role in, uh, in rail, um, I think there's so much opportunity for rail to um, in, improve the way we deal with waste uh, and, and, and make that uh, a much more successful uh, for our industry. So there's obviously lots of opportunity to join up the different aspects of the way we do these things from government right the way through to all the, the, the very detailed bits of our, um, our industry. So I think, yeah, the, 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 what, what we need to do is to go back to our clients and really pinpoint these issues around waste management and make sure we can raise these issues with them and get them to try and change and adapt the way they're thinking so we can improve the way we do with waste.